So welcome everyone to our Women in STEM Career Panel. My name is Vicki Herdina and we're really excited to bring this first in our series of virtual career panels from Career Connect Southwest, a program of ESD 112. We have an amazing panel lined up today and our goal is that hopefully you learn something about a career that you didn't know anything about before this broadcast. So thank you to all of our middle and high school students that submitted questions for our panelists and we're excited to get started. So I want to introduce our moderator for the day, Sue Bluestein, who is our math specialist at ESD 112 and has a long history of working with girls and women in STEM subjects. So take it away, Sue. All right, thanks, Vicki. So um, I'd like to start by taking a few minutes and having each one of our panelists today introduce themselves, their name, their um, specialty, their job title, the company they work for, and just a little bit about themselves so we can get to know them better. So what I'm going to do is start with Ananya, and then we'll go to Deborah, Kim, Masa, and Gina. So uh, we can start with you, Ananya. Hello, I'm Ananya. I am a molecular engineering student at the University of Chicago. Um, I also do research in the Pritzker School of Molecular Engineering um, in one of the labs. I actually work with um, one of our other panelists, Kim. She's my mentor. Um, and yeah, and molecular engineering, it's a really new field, um, but it's like very interdisciplinary with different areas from STEM. Um, and we work to solve like big problems, but at a very small scale. So that's why it's called molecular engineering. Um, and also I love promoting um, involvement of women in STEM. I'm really involved in Society for Women in Engineering um, at my university, so we do a lot of um, encouragement for women and girls to get involved in STEM. So it's great that you all are here. And um, besides STEM, I really like to do other things as well, such as running. I like to hula hoop. Um, I also like music a lot. So that's just a bit about me. Thank you very much. Uh, Deborah. how about you? So my name is Deb Morozik. And um, like Ananya, I have a focus on solving complicated or big big problems, but uh, unlike her, my focus is on big problems. Uh, I have both a bachelor's and a master's in human-centered systems engineering, which is really thinking about how do you engineer very large, complex systems where the hum humans are an integral part portion. Uh, originally, it was uh, started back in the 50s uh, when we had things like space spaceships and weaponry that were so complicated that if we didn't take into account the human uh, and the human's capabilities uh, correctly, people would die to the world today where we also think about how do we make it usable, useful, fun, exciting, relevant, uh, whether it's products or experiences. I've been doing this for about 35 years and right now I am the co-founder of a consultancy focused on this. And I've done a wide range of things from redesigning control rooms and nuclear power plants to helping HP define what it take, what would take to bring printers into the home back in the 90s, uh, to recently working with uh, companies that manufacture uh, personal protective equipment and figuring out how to integrate sensors. What would it take to integrate sensors into this equipment so that we can better keep um, high-risk workers safe? So quite a wide variety of things. Anything uh, that you enjoy personally on your own time? Uh, walking, uh, hiking, and uh, cooking. I'm, I'm kind of known as the local go-to, and if anybody has any cooking questions amongst my friends. Thank you. Uh, Kim, we can't hear you, sorry. OK. There we uh, go. Does it work now? <laughs> yep. OK, sorry. Hi, I'm Kim. I am a uh, postdoctoral researcher in, the, uh, in molecular engineering, uh, working with Ananya, as she just told you. Um, and, I, uh, and soon I'll be a professor of material science and engineering at Clemson University. And right now, I am a, uh, or I, I'm really excited about, uh, I'm an experimentalist. Uh, that studies things at all sorts of 
at the interface of all sorts of fields. And so um, I've always been fascinated by how things work. Um, and right now, I'm particularly fascinated by uh, biological materials, um, which uh, behave completely differently than the kinds of materials that we uh, that we know how to build out of normally. And I uh, started as a physicist, um, but I've studied many different uh, things, uh, and and now I now I work in. Uh, at the interface of physics and biology and engineering, uh, where I'm always excited to explore new kinds of science. Um, and in my own time, I, or when I'm not in the lab, which some people think I never leave the lab, um, but when I'm not in the lab, I really enjoy art and uh, languages. And so I studied maybe five different languages besides English, and I love photography and painting and uh, woodworking. Thank you. Uh, Martha, how about you? All right. Um, hi, good morning, everyone. I'm very excited to be here. My name is Massa. I'm a civil engineer. Uh, with so many years of experience, part of my work experience uh, is working on in different countries. Um, I work for um, Mackins Posito, is a local firm in Vancouver. Um, my role is transportation for my firm. Uh, my team and I, we design roadways, uh, highways, uh, utilities, uh, which brings uh, power, brings uh, internet to your home, uh, gas and water and uh, other needs. Um, I'm originally from Iran. Um, I have my bachelor degree in civil engineering from back home. Uh, my husband and I, we moved uh, to Canada and then after that to USA about uh, 16 years ago. Um, I also have my master's degree in civil engineering from Portland State University. Um, I enjoy my job um, uh, and working with people. I feel uh, we make difference in people's life and that's the main thing I, I, I like about my job. Um, outside of work, uh, I enjoy spending time with my two daughters. I, I like to take them to outdoor activities like camping. Um, I also love music, dancing, and cooking, like Debra. <laughs> um, I'm excited, and uh, yeah, thanks. Thank you. And then we have Kim. Oh, no, I'm sorry, Gina. Good morning, everyone. My name is Gina, and currently I work as an outdoor educator. I went to school and I studied science. I studied geology and biology and interactions between the two. And I've always enjoyed the field of geology because it involves lots of outdoor teaching. And so I've made a career of learning how to teach outdoors. I currently work for a nonprofit organization at Mount St. Helens, and we teach about the science and stories of Mount St. Helens through field trips, online learning. I'm doing a lot of videos about volcanoes right now during our COVID-19 time, but it allows me to teach in a different way than in the classroom. So field-based teaching, being surrounded by the birds, the rocks and the plants is really uh, what I love. And I feel like it's one of my strengths to teach outdoors. On my personal time, I love the snow. I love getting out in the winter time. I have cross-country skis. And even when it snows in Portland, which is rare, I like to hop on my skis before the snow plows get out and cruise all the different city streets. Thank you all for sharing. We really appreciate you being here today. So uh, let's get started with the first question. And this question, um, I'm going to open up to any of you who wants to speak first. And it is, and I give you a moment to think, how would you describe a typical work day or work week for you on your job? Uh, 
I can okay, go thanks. first. <laughs> um, so there's a lot of flexibility uh, in my firm with the uh, hours, but we would like to, uh, as a team, work together. So we try to be at work between nine to four, but of course there are lots of flexibility. So in terms of work hours, um, five days working, eight to five is a normal. Um, the nature of our work is team working. So um, it's team, it's about three to maybe seven, eight team member that uh, constantly we need to interact with each other. Thank you. All right, Deborah. Great. We don't have sound. Thank you. Uh, I would say I, I go very differently because my company is virtual. Uh, my other co-founder is in Austin, Texas, and we have people on our team from Chicago, uh, Bay Area, and Long Beach, California as well. And our clients, frankly, are all over the world. And so almost everything we do is virtually. Occasionally, we will visit a, a client site or go to a location to teach a workshop uh, at a conference but most of what we do is through Google Suite, Zoom, Google Meet, chats, phone, text. And so our, our days are very fluid because it's uh, a lot of what we do is as asynchronous. In other words, uh, not always at the same time. Although we do have a high value in working as a team, but we use a lot of collaboration tools to do so, as well as a lot of technology. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, Gina. My workday is pretty different. I work sometimes in an office, but I also work a lot in the field. Currently with my current job, I lead many field trips that occur at Mount St. Helens. Some of these field trips are for elementary school classrooms. Some of these field trips are for colleges that are coming to learn about Mount St. Helens and the volcano, the eruption. And so my workday can really vary it's very seasonally dependent. So during the spring and fall when we have our school programs, sometimes I go and I go into classrooms to give programs to schools. And sometimes uh, we have buses that come for day trips or schools that come for overnight trips. In the summer, we do more longer field trips where maybe we have programs for high school students that are five days long. So I get to do a lot more camping with folks in the summertime. During the fall, we go back to a school season of field trips. And then in the winter, I spend my time preparing for the entire year. So that's a lot of organizing our supplies, figuring out what our trips are gonna look like, designing the curriculum and the way that we're teaching and coordinating with all of the people involved to make field-based learning possible. That's a little snapshot of the day. Sometimes it involves outdoor cooking. Sometimes it involves outdoor games. Sometimes it's raining really hard and all we want to do is take shelter under the trees to be dry. Thank you. Kim, I saw your hand up. Yeah, um, my day is kind of different from all of these, but a lot uh, uh, shares a lot of things in the same um, with um, some of the first things. Like a lot of my day is collaborating. Um, and so, I, I'm a researcher right now. I'm a researcher in a lab, so I spend most of my day in the lab. But a lot of the best uh, ideas come from talking to people in the hallway or going to uh, talks and meeting with people. And so I spend a lot of time uh, talking with colleagues both at my university and um, all over the world through the internet. Right now, uh, we're very virtual, like. Uh, Deb, um, which uh, I think probably most of the world is very virtual right now. Um, and it's a very different uh, style of work for me than normal because I'm used to running into people all the time. Um, and I'm also used to a lot of my uh, workday um, being uh, involved with uh, helping other people learn about uh, how to do research and you know and and learning together uh, how to explore the kinds of uh, science that we're we're learning um, but most of my work is uh, I mean a, a large part of my work is also just at the bench in the lab where I get to 
use my hands and build new equipment and design new experiments um, and analyze data uh, using computers, and things like that. Thank you. Ananya, did you have anything you wanted to add? Um, so like my day is kind of different. Um, a little bit like Kim's because sometimes I do research, but I'm also a student. So it's like a balance of both. Um, in the summers, I do research um, full time. So during that, it's a very unique experience because um, you do get to work on um, research, whether, um, so like, so what I was doing last summer, it was um, experimental research. Um, so I got to learn from my mentors and also um, talk to other people who are my seniors and learn about their research and what they're doing, which is interesting because um, it gives you new ideas, maybe something that you might want to do in the future. Um, and also, I, like, I also got the opportunity to go to talks as well. Um, during the year, it's a bit different um, because I do have to do my classes as well. Um, but my classes and my and the research lab that I'm in, they're very interrelated because they're in the same department. So a lot of the classes and um, whatever I'm learning from those classes, as I learn more and more, I'm like, oh, this is the kind of thing. This is why I was doing this certain thing in my research. And um, yeah, so that so that's like a, it's a different dynamic, but it's super fun to be involved in research as a student. Um, especially if you're planning on doing that later on as well. It's a really nice experience. Thank you. Well, I see a common theme between all of you. There's a lot of teamwork, a lot of communication that goes on, whether it's virtual or in person. I was thinking about um, the different types of engineering and STEM professions that you have, and I was thinking, can you think of a project that you worked on that you could describe to students? And I was thinking, or one to start with Deborah. The Human Factors Manager sounds like such an interesting title. And it said in your biography about uh, making a family-friendly computer or a printer so you could have it at home. I'm just curious about. Well, this this was work that we did, or I led uh, back in probably early 90s when, um, if you think back then, uh, some of you may not have been born back then, but uh, back then, pretty much printers were in offices or if they were any place else, they were on long sheets of paper and they were dot matrix and they went <laughs> and they were very loud and very expensive and not very easy to read. And HP had, was the one of the number, one of the top producers of both laser jets and ink jets. And at the time HP had first come out with a printer that was less than a thousand dollars for a, a, an inkjet printer and everybody was like, wow, that's amazing price point. And at that point, um, the lab manager came to me and said, can you figure out what it would take for people to want to bring a printer into their home? And so I designed research and we went and visited families uh, all over the world. It was called ethnographic research or field research where we would spend a day in the life of a family. We typically would show up at two or three in the afternoon whenever the students got off of school and stay with them throughout the evening and just spend time with them, live with them, learn with them, explore how technology is used in their home and what they would imagine a printer, you know, what it would take for a printer to be something that they wanted in their home. And then we collected up all this information that we learned from people all over the world um, and then munched it all together and came up with some ideas and definitions and concepts of what it would take for people to really be interested in starting to bring computers uh, and printers into their homes. And that was, uh, a lot of that work was foundational to uh, the direction that HP went with the, their lower, lower price printers. Thank you. Um, Mata, I was looking at yours as an engineer for McKay's Casito. 
and you said you work on uh, managing roadways and uh, utility projects. So can you mention or describe one that you've worked on? Sure. Uh, well, I love all my projects, but <laughs> because I feel it brings value to all of our life. But I think my favorite project uh, are uh, park improvement projects because I, I can see happy faces, the kids with family, they walk into the new park area and they, they enjoy the facility. Um, the one I'm very excited and we're currently working on it is the Harmony Sport Complex. It's in Vancouver. We are currently working with Clark County to improve the existing facility, bring more soccer fields, uh, improve the existing baseball court, um, of course improve the parking because there's not enough parking uh, for all the visitors uh, when it comes to tournament. It's a back, back up, traffic is back up. So our job as an engineer is to improve the traffic when it comes to tournament and um, people need for parking and work with uh, project owners and um, county uh, to add more facility into the existing one. I'm very excited uh, for that project to come. Thank you. And then we have um, Kimberly and Ananya. You both work, well, we have I see molecular engineering and uh, material science. I'm curious about the material science. Either one of you want to talk about a project with either one of those? So I, I'm, I mean, Ananya is free to talk, but maybe I'll try. Uh, so I, um, I work with biological materials. And so um, like normally we think of, uh, when, when, when we build a building, we build it out of like steel and concrete. Um, and when there's an earthquake or a tornado, we don't want it to change much, the structure. Uh, but biology builds things. Um, uh, sometimes, like our our bodies, our lungs, our cells, uh, are built such that they're always dynamic and always changing. Uh, they change their shape and they respond to their environment and they adapt. And so I study the like structure of a cell. Um, so, like instead of the wood and concrete and steel that you build, you know, the structure of a building or a bridge, uh, the cell is made up of little fibers uh, that are uh, f that are flexible. And I study this like a structural material. Uh, we study how it responds to forces and how it uh, can exert forces on its environment. But I don't study it in a cell. I take like chicken, grind it up, and purify out just the component that makes this structural material. And then we purify different components and we add it to it and see how it changes the material properties. Um, and one thing that I've done, uh, my, my kind of favorite project that I've worked on recently, um, is I've taken this material that normally behaves like a, uh, a solid, like an, like an elastic, like structural material, and I've turned it into a liquid. Um, and then it has all sorts of crazy properties uh, because it's not a regular liquid like water, it's a liquid made up of these fibers. And so um, these liquids uh, exhibit really special properties like they can organize themselves into different structures if they have multiple components and they can change their shape by themselves. And so I like to study these adaptive and responsive materials that are that are derived from biology. Okay. Gina, do you have anything you'd like to add? I don't think for this question. Okay. All right. Thank you. And Ananya? Yeah, I think like Kim got like most of it. All right. <laughs> so I know another question. Like, we've got middle school and high school girls watching this. And they might say, well, what did you want to be when you were in high school? And how did you get to where you are now? Okay, Deborah. I had to unmute. Uh, so I went to high school in a time where girls in STEM were not as common as they are today. 
and I knew I wanted to get into engineering because it was applied science and I knew I liked people. So I liked that intersection. I was looking for something that was the intersection of people and engineering. I started at University of Illinois in uh, biomedical engineering because I was told by some counselor that that's people in, in, and engineering is engineering things that, that go inside of people. Uh, one semester in when I was in human anatomy and bisecting or dissecting a, a human body, I thought, mm, not for me. I don't really like the insides of people. So from there I went and uh, got involved and I kind of pivoted a little bit on my career or my studies and went into biomechanics and worked with a professor on biomechanics. And I thought that was a little bit more interesting because it was around uh, how do we understand and think about uh, how bodies move and what the ranges of motion are and things and whether it was in a lab or working with a custom prosthetist who made uh, high performance um, prosthetics for people who, who were athletes or dancers. It was all around the biomechanics of it. And I thought, okay, this is kind of more interesting because it's like, how do you use engineering to help people? But even that wasn't quite right. And I stumbled upon something called human factors, which was how do you take into account people's social, emotional, mental, cognitive capabilities, their desires, their behaviors, and make sure that systems are designed to take that into account. And I thought, aha, that's, that's it, that's me. Um, but back then, as I said, most of it was applied to how do we keep people from dying? And so it was a matter of, do I wanna work in airplanes or submarines or space stations or nuclear power plants? Because those were the places that were complex, complex enough that if you didn't take a human into account, their biomechanics and their cognitive abilities, you didn't take that human into account, people died. So that was kind of my micro pivots along the way uh, in my education. Thank you for sharing. Okay, Gina? So ever since I was young, I spent a lot of time outdoors. And I was curious, um, about why things were the way that they were. So for example, with my grandfather and my sisters, we used to go into the woods behind my house and we would find the biggest rocks. We would call these rocks pride rocks. We'd climb on top and usually my grandfather would bring along some ice cream. Be like, wow, we made it to the top of pride rock. These were boulders maybe the size of a car and we'd get to celebrate with ice cream. Then I went to school for geology and in the process of learning and discovering why I was so excited about geology as a field was because it answered questions that I had when I was younger. So why are there huge boulders in the middle of the woods in Southern Rhode Island where I grew up? These boulders were plucked from mountains much further north, maybe as far north as Canada or even further north into uh, many miles from the border and carried by glaciers and these glaciers deposited the big cobbles uh, in my backyard and as a kid I was able to climb on these structures and get a sense for how big they were and then when I learned about glaciers and the process of how um, material gets moved across continents on the surface it really gave me context for you know I could think in my head wow that boulder was so big granted I was young when we used to go for the ice cream so I was maybe a couple you know four or five years old so the boulder seemed especially large and climbing them was a particular feat but that's really stuck with me the um, trying to puzzle and learn the whys of the world and geology has given me many tools for looking at the landscape as an educator an outdoor educator I teach about geology, I also teach about natural history. So why do we have certain trees growing where we do? Oftentimes it has to do with the rocks that are underground or the angle of the slope or the history of the area, whether there were glaciers or not. And all of these questions um, can start to be answered or at least not answered, but puzzled over with some of the tools of the natural sciences. And so I've been since a young age, I think I was interested in these questions and then I found a discipline that served me. And now working as a teacher and an educator, I get to communicate and share 
the puzzling that I do. And it's very, very rewarding. Thank you. Martha, you said you had something you wanted to share? Sure, um, kind of similar experience uh, where when we all were at high school, I guess that's a started for me at the same time too. I, I, I remember I was enjoying uh, solving mathematic problems. When it comes to choose between uh, working on mathematic homeworks or uh, biology, reading biology, I was going with mathematic. It was just easier for me. I like the logic, I like that two plus two is four, it's not 4.2, it's not 3.8, it's four. So I like the logic behind mathematics, um, but when I uh, was serious, uh, became serious to be engineer, it was uh, when with my cousins we were sitting and talking about who wants to do for their future, for our future, and most of them were boy cousins. Uh, they were talking about uh, engineering path for them. And I told them, hey, I think I'm going to college uh, for an engineering college too. And one of them told me, you know, Masa, engineering is not for girls. I'm like, oh, then I want to be engineer. <laughs> so I wanted to prove to him and to everyone that women can be engineer, not just engineer, good engineers. Um, and that's how I became uh, oh, became uh, serious to be an engineer. Thank you. And Anya? So um, I always really, really liked math, and um, I used to like spend my free time um, solving puzzles. So I would buy like um, puzzle books, and um, they had like logic problems in it, and I would love doing that. Um, so I would just solve it, and it was so much fun. And then in middle school, um, I went to a camp. I think I was in around fifth grade. Um, so one of the summers, I went to a camp, and it was about genetics. And it was so interesting. Like, I, I was like, wow, this is so cool. Um, and like uh, a couple of years later, when we started learning about it in school, I was like, oh, like this is so cool. I can map Punnett squares. I would draw Punnett squares. I would make pedigree charts um, for my family. Like I would be like, oh, this is why um, this certain person is this blood type. And then um, in high school, I got to take biology courses. It wasn't as fun as I expected it to be. And I was really struggling for some time. Once I started understanding it more, I was like, oh, this is cool. However, it's not as cool as genetics. And then I was like, oh, I think what I really like about genetics is that it has some math in it. I think that's what I really like. And then I started taking more of the harder physical sciences courses. So um, the chemistry and the physics. And I really, really like chemistry a lot. And I was like, oh, like this kind of thing, I can sit down and I, I won't notice the time go by. I can just solve problems I, and I can just think about this. And I thought, I think what I just really liked was the statistical aspects of genetics and how biology can be applied to people. Um, and then I was just like, oh, I can't decide which science and, or which part of math I really wanna do. There, it's, it's all so great, I can't decide. And I applied, when I applied, um, for college, I forgot what I even applied for. And it turned out I had applied for molecular engineering and I realized um, after I committed and after I visited, I was like, oh, this is what I applied for. And I was like, oh, this seems pretty cool. And then I realized, oh, this is exactly what I wanted to do. It's very interdisciplinary. It has a little bit of everything. And at a high level for engineering, just in general, you have to pull in skills from everywhere. So it was what I wanted at the end. Um, so a bit different because I'm not a geneticist by any means, but I still use skills from all the sciences and um, various aspects of math. Thank you. Deborah? I keep losing the unmute button. Um, I think one of the points that was made and has been made several times is really key, which is almost everything today is interdisciplinary. Even if it's, I'm a civil engineer or a human factors engineer, it really is. How do you bring the right physics, the right math, the right chemistry, the right material science, the right this, the right that all together to solve, to solve problems? Mm -hmm. You know, what uh, Masa said reminded me of a question we did get from a student that said, 
Did any of you feel pressed to avoid feminine jobs, such as nursing or teaching? Or it could also be the reverse, where any of you pressured to do an, uh, normally a, a feminine job, such as teaching or nursing? Uh, I would say that um, I wasn't pressed to do that, uh, but it was, I did have to kind of get over the fact that when I walked into a, a class at, at the university, I was typically the token girl in the class. Maybe there would be two, but typically if there were any girls in the class, it would be one and it would be me. But eventually I got over that and got used to it and it was not a big deal. And the more people interacted with how I did work and what I brought to the table, the fact that I was female became a non-issue. Thank you. Um, Martha, you said you, you had your hand up. Just a, just a memory I wanted to share. Uh, when uh, we were just at Mithet, we were eight out of 40 in our uh, uh, classroom, eight girls out of 40, um, we admitted to the program. Uh, the very first month, or maybe second month, we were in the college. One of our faculty, this is really uh, bad memory, but he asked us, all eight of us, uh, asked us to consider change, changing our major. He said, maybe as a girl, as a woman, you are, you are not successful. This is very hard. This is for boys. It's always being at the field. Um, so I'm glad none of us uh, changed our major or listened to him to change our major. We all became very successful. Most of us, we got to ma uh, higher education. We continued master degree even at PhD level. Um, there's a lot of opportunities in each major. And I, I am so glad none of us uh, listened to him and got impressed by what he told us. Um, we just um we stayed positive and we stayed focused and uh that's uh that was a story i wanted to share thank you kim um yeah like uh like um deb and masha i've i've had some uh experiences like that particularly like deb i was the only girl or female in my uh in, as a physics major out of 40 physics majors um, at my university. And at first that was kind of, uh, you know, kind of weird. Uh, in, in high school, I'd never, or middle school, I'd never been in a class where I was the only female. I never really let it bother me. Um, but it, it was, you know, sometimes the guys, they talk about weird things or something and you're thinking, oh, <laughs> clearly I'm an outsider. Um, but the, but uh, like people have been saying, like as you progress in the field um, at, at, or, you know, as you are progressing your courses or in the field, uh, things, it matters more, like it matters more what you're doing and what you're producing and what you're thinking about and talking about and contributing to the field than maybe what you're, how different you are from uh, the, the other, uh, your classmates. Um, and um, some of, uh, you know, many of the physics majors uh, that I was with are still my friends. And uh, today, and um, you know, it got uh, in grad school. It wasn't much different. I was also one of the only females. Um, and but in addition to having sometimes um, discouragement, like Masha uh, has uh, related, I also was lucky enough to have a lot of encouragement. And I had some really wonderful mentors. Um, and I had the pleasure of working with some uh, amazing scientists, uh, and, uh, both female and male, who, who were very encouraging of, uh, you know, someone who just really loved uh, the research and, uh, and 
So I didn't know that I wanted to be a researcher. I had no idea what it was, and I didn't know what a real scientist did. I thought I wanted to be a teacher. Um, but my mentors uh, saw how much I loved uh, playing in the lab, and they encouraged me to pursue a science, uh, 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 they encouraged me to pursue um, my field that I'm in now, and kind of showed me uh, that this is an option that I didn't even know about. Thank you. Oh, uh, Gina, did you have your hand up earlier? And then um, I'm just looking at the time as well. We have another interesting question from students. What advice would you have for students who aren't interested in a four-year college degree? Gina? So for folks who are interested in doing more field-based work, I work with a nonprofit that partners with federal agencies currently the Forest Service, but I've partnered with other agencies such as the National Park Service. These federal agencies have lots of internship programs. They have won the Forest Service as an internship program if you have served in the military, they, um, and a couple of other pathway programs that allow um, opportunity to work in public lands and resources and research management. Um, it's a little bit of a different direction than studying the way that I did, I studied, I got a four-year degree in geology and then a master's degree in education and teaching. But sometimes taking a break to do some of those internships can give uh, you perspective. It certainly gave me perspective about whether I want to work in this industry, in this field. And there are many internships available um, for high school age students as well. Some of the internships are offered through partnering nonprofit organizations such as the one that I work for called the Mount St. Helens Institute, but often there also are many internship opportunities through the National Forest Service and the National Park Service. Thank you. Anyone else like to talk on that topic? Kim? I, I just like to add, I mean, although many of us uh, pursued four-year degrees as our, you know, like, that's like a norm, that's a, a um, a path, uh, one path to working in STEM, uh, but I think it's most important that you pursue the kind of work that you love. Um, and sometimes, uh, the, you know, there are many paths to get to where uh, you like the kind of work that you love to do, mm -hmm. and not everybody's path is the same. And so, obviously, <laughs> for example, we have many different paths here, um, but but a four-year degree can can um, can you know help you get towards uh, certain career goals. But there are many interesting opportunities, like Gina um, mentioned, uh, people working in the military. Uh, uh, there's a lot of um, options, uh, like a lot of uh, technical and STEM, like engineering type uh, training and professions associated. Uh, with the, you know, I mean, most people in the military or the Coast Guard or things are trained in very technical um, and engineering type disciplines. And there's a lot of internships also at cities and, and companies that don't require four-year degrees uh, necessarily, or maybe at the beginning. Um, and I think internships are a great way to explore uh, different kinds of uh, career paths. So um, probably most probably most of us, that's how we uh, of you know by by working in different uh, uh, by trying out different fields is how we really find out the field that we love. Sometimes you can be paid for these internships also, I believe, yeah. And um, Ananya, do you have anything you'd like to share? Um, well, one thing I just wanted to add was a lot of times um, during 
in high, like during high school and even during college, um, a lot of people are uncertain about exactly what they want to do, and that's perfectly normal. Um, so I think the best thing to do in that case is what you guys are doing, which is to um, to attend these kind of panels and talk to people um, about exactly what they're doing. And you can always try new things. If you don't like something, if you um, if you try out a certain um, pathway and you realize hmm, it's not really for me, you can always switch because you have you have like time to switch, and no one's gonna say, oh wait. You say like you you started this, but you you don't want to do this anymore. That's perfectly normal, and it's actually a valuable experience because if you find out, oh, this was one area of um, biology, for example, that I thought I liked, but then after I did it, I don't really like it anymore. That's fine because that was a valuable experience because you found out you didn't like that. So finding out that you don't like things is also a valuable experience as well, because then that gets you closer to doing what you actually like. Thank you. Um, and the, uh, next question is, do you see an advantage of being a female in your field? Martha? Well, um, that's a very good question. Uh, I guess uh, if I don't look at it as advantage, I look at it as value. Um, advantage, maybe we don't have uh, that many female engineers, it's good to have more, uh, but I still look at it as a value. Um, being female to me is not as advantage or disadvantage, it's a value. It's like uh, diversity. We need female in engineering, in STEM, in science, because um, we don't have that diversity. Uh, Diversity brings value to to each field. As a woman, especially in my field, um, the value women can bring is um, we all are by nature. We are uh, detail oriented. We women can handle multitasking. Uh, easier um, in, in general than men, there are exceptions, but <laughs> as in uh, modern nature just gave us that ability to be more detail oriented to, uh, just these are example as I'm trying to say, and these are value as a woman you can bring to your, uh, to your team, to your industry. There are so many other values, I just wanted to give ex example. Um, same as uh, I would like to mention other diversity, Pe people in color, I, I believe uh, there is value they can bring to their team, to the industry. Um, for example, for me, culturally, we are so, um, uh, we love socializing, we're so uh, easy connecting with people. Uh, these things are bringing value. Uh, just. I would say we need to think about what value as a woman, as a person in color, you can bring to your industry, to your team, and uh, just uh, th th then we can say uh, maybe it's an advantage. <laughs> Thank you. Deborah? Just quickly to follow up on that value notion, one of the things that I've been studying on and off for the last uh, 10 to 15 years is how do you quantify or put a number on the value of innovation? And there are quite a few studies that say cross-disciplinary teams that have uh, broad diversity, women, people of color, et cetera, outperform teams that are um, are not diverse. And so bringing that diversity of perspective, of language, of culture, of color, of, gen of gender really brings um, value to the table when it comes to collaboration. Maya? So in my experience, I actually love being a woman in STEM. Um, and it's a very empowering feeling. Um, so actually, when I was in um, middle school and early high school, there was um, equal involvement of women and men in STEM fields. And then I walked into my first computer science class in high school, and there was only a, one other girl in the class. And I was shocked because I was like, I've never seen this before. And like, I was, I was like, like nowadays it's like that. I was like, oh, that, that's really, that's like, that's wild. And I actually, I quite frankly, I did not like the class at all um, because all the guys 
had some computer science experience. I had zero computer science experience. Um, but I, I made it through the class and then and I was like, hmm, I, I don't really like this. And then in college, um, especially in the molecular engineering major itself, there are very, very few women um, just because it's a new major. Um, and also that's just how it is. Like it, that's just how it's turned out, um, especially for my class. Um, but I really like that in a way that we were the, the starting involvement of um, women in the engineering because we have our own group and we collaborate with each other. And also there's this idea, like I feel confident because I'm like, oh, I'm, I'm unique because I'm a woman in STEM and um, we have events for women in STEM. We have, uh, we have panels. Um, we are, we talk to um, the women professors in our department. So it's been a great experience because I made so many friends just because we are women in engineering, um, which is great. And it's really nice to see more um, women coming into the department, especially because um, I'm the first um, and currently only South Asian woman in the major. And I think in my class, there are only two women of color, including me. So it's really nice that I see more people coming in and, um, and we're building something for them that they can have this community. So it's been great being a woman in STEM, even though there's so few of us. Um, I really like how we have the dynamic of being able to solve problems together just because, I mean, those are engineering problems, but we, we're able to relate to each other because we're underrepresented in this. So we, are, we solve our engineering problems together. And uh, one of my, let's see, one of my last questions is, um, what single most important piece of advice would you give us as students? Ananya? So I would say um, one thing that's really important um, obviously, there's like m many different, there's a lot of advice that um, you'll receive. One thing that has really helped me is um, that there will be times when you're going through um, your classes or your research or your career path and you run into obstacles. And there will be times when you're like, oh, this is not for me. I can do something way easier. I should just quit. But every time I think that, and for some reason, I'm like, okay, no, I'll just, I'll just stick it through and I'll see what happens. It always works out. Um, so there's always this idea of whenever you start something new, sometimes there's a steep learning curve, but you have to be okay with that. And um, you'll find that as you get along and you struggle more and more, you get, your skin gets thicker. And then when you get to new obstacles, you're like, oh, I've had this challenge before. And um, although I'm struggling now, I know that before, whenever I had a challenge, I like this, I made it through. So stick it through and you will see the rewards. Um, it's worked for me every time. Um, so yeah, that, that, that's probably my biggest piece of advice. Thank you. Uh, Gina? One thing that's helped me a lot is finding a group of people who are not, um, I have friends, but I also have friends or um, I call them mentors who do what I do. Maybe these folks are older than me and I became friends with them because I saw they were doing something that I thought was cool and maybe I wanted to do it. Maybe these folks are younger than me and they're doing things more creatively than I am doing. But I've built for myself a network of mentors for the career goals that I have. And maybe some of those goals may not be, you know, I want to be a geologist working in this state at this geologic survey, but I want to have mentors around me who are strong communicators, science communicators. Maybe they're strong um, in understanding natural history and natural systems. And so I've worked to create a network of these people and I keep in touch with them differently, um, but also in the same types of ways that I keep in touch with my friends. So if I find an article or maybe I write a reflective piece myself, I have people I can share with that uh, have common 
have career goals in common with me. And so I found it very, very helpful to build a network of mentors. And I keep in touch with these people. I write letters, I send cards and notes, and I receive gifts from them as well. One of my mentors, who's an incredible natural historian, um, once knit me, and I should have worn it today, but it is a scarf where every row of stitches represents a different um, amount of time, and the entire scarf represents the age of the earth. And so the geologic time scale is knit into the scarf with different geologic eras in different colors. And she even put little charms on when there were dinosaurs, there's a dinosaur charm. And when there were the first plants, there's a little plant charm. So she created this incredible piece that's in itself a piece for science communication, a piece for geology education, and just a piece for fun. And she is one of my mentors. So building a network of professional mentors for yourself, even when you're in high school, is not, um, you can never be too forward and saying, hey, I really like what you're doing and I wanna know more. Do you have an email list? Can I get on your list? Do you mind if I add you to a list of my contacts? Thank you. She also, if I can add one thing, she knitted mm -hmm. a scarf for Neil deGrasse Tyson that was the scale of the universe and mailed it to him as well. <laughs> so. Martha, did you wanna add something? Just want to add, uh, um, this is all right uh, to be scared or confused what you want to do in high school. It's normal, as other uh, panelists mentioned here. But uh, I want to say we are living in a country that there are so much support, so much help. Just go for it. Use what is available. There are so much mentorship program, internship, and just take, take that. And then that definitely helps you to um, to define what you want to do, or uh, you still may not be 100% certain, that's all right. I think most of us were not certain. We were just important to educate yourself as much as you can and then focus and go for it. Uh, don't let that un uncertainty push you back. Any last comments anybody would like to make? Deborah? I just wanted <clears throat> to follow up with Gina said and Networking is key. I mean, whether it's networking early in your career, later in your career, uh, peer mentoring, peer coaching, networking. So many times I've had opportunities come to me or I've given opportunities to others because of my network. It's, it's never too early to start building that and contributing to it. Don't just take from the network, but give to, to the people in your network as well. Thank you. We are actually out of time, unfortunately. Um, I'd like to thank all of you as women in STEM panelists today for joining us for our first virtual career panel. And we hope students have learned something about a job they didn't know much before and that they are inspired by you. Thank you so much for sharing your time with us today. And Vicki? Thanks, Sue, and uh, once again to all the panelists, thank you so much. This has been really inspirational to listen to um, as a teacher and as a, what Sue and I like to think of ourselves as, as, as growing the next generation of women in STEM up through the kindergarten through 12th grade system. So this has been a wonderful opportunity, a great way to kick off this series of panels. Thank you again very much. So next week, our panel is going to focus on uh, professionals from the world of business and finance. If you have questions for those professionals, be sure to get in touch with your teachers so you can submit them ahead of time. Teachers, if you'd like to learn more about how to support this program, please get in touch with us at Career Connect Southwest. And from our whole team, thank you for joining us today. Check back next week for our next video uh, career panel. And stay home, stay safe, and have a great day. Thanks. <laughs>